Hi, hello. It is perfect temperature today. Thank you very much and good evening. My name is Yong Lee. I'm an assistant professor, faculty fellow from the Department of East Asian Studies at New York University. Uh, first of all, um, thank you very much for your invitation, Anselm Franke and um, Hyunjin Kim and David Tay. Um, it is pr true privilege to be part of presenters of Two or Three Tigers, this course program with uh, such a, a stellar and distinguished artists and curators and writers focusing on contemporary um, comparative um, research on Asian modernity formation through animal images, spe specifically focusing on tiger as the medium at the limits of modern society, which, uh, which is uh, carrying an imprint of how contemporary cultures um, have been shaped by um, encounters with otherness. So today I'm going to talk about um, the taxidermy of time, the tigers as chronotope of continual coloniality in Korea. So in this talk, um, my primary um, concern um, is mainly focused on the conceptualizations of the subject of the non-human and the animality issues in, re in representation of the tiger in particular in images of the colonial and post-colonial periods of Korea. The portrayal of animals and the concept of animality have been reflected in all of the various stages of collective memory in the formation of Korean modernity throughout the history of Japanese colonialism, the Korean War, anti-communism and Americanisms, and Korea's role in the Vietnam War in the Cold War era. So in this sense, the representational problem of non-human and animistic subjectivities in post-colonial Korea cast several seminal questions concerning the formation of colonial modernity, which can be traced back to the Japanese occupation period and the post-war dictatorial governmentality through biopolitics by highly racialized tropes and ethnicized cultural discourses. However, the epistemological dichotomy is still embedded in the collective memory of Koreans as a form of anti-communist ideology, for example, racism and xenophobia. So through overviewing theoretical and critical analysis of the subject of the human versus animal, <coughs> discourses of animality and the images of tigers questioning the relationship between the concept of the present past as a primordial and animal as a chronotope of colonial, um, continual coloniality, I will discuss the monoethnic imagery of nationalism. Um, symptomatic tropes within the formation of um, colonial modernity and its impact upon the collective conscious and unconscious during the post-colonial era through the representation of tigers. There are two Siberian tigers, also known as the Manchurian tigers or simply put Joseon Horangi, the Korean tiger, enshrined in the endangered species hall at the American Museum of Natural History in New York. These melancholic stuffed reproductions of tigers as an ethereal spectacle of non-existence once had roamed the harsh mountain woodlands stretching from East Russia to the Korean Peninsula until the first half of the 20th century, but are now all but vanished. <coughs> According to Marilyn Lee Tyler, many hundreds of years ago, the ancient Mongolian empires designate hundreds of square miles of land north of the Tuman River near Vladivostok, Vladivostok <coughs> as a sanctuary for tiger imported from India. Um, these are some of the um, images from Mongolian empires, mural paintings of the Mongol uh, with the chained tigers symbolizing the supremacy of the Mongolians. By calling the genetically superior and largest subspecies amongst the fellies, Mongolians improved on physique of the massive, light-colored Siberian tigers, which reached 4.25 meters in length and weighed over 250 kilograms. After the sanctuary was abandoned, the tigers spread north to Sakhalin Island and to the Korean Peninsula. And here, they bred with the local tiger population, creating a massive subspecies in Joseon. 
During the late 19th to early 20th century in Korea, Siberian tigers were hunted and killed by Western trophy hunters, including British sportsman and writer Ford G. Buckley, um, co-authored with the uh, very um, notorious book entitled The Big Game of Asia and North America, published in 1915, and Japanese colonizers under the Fermin extermination projects um, in Korean Hesugujajagop. An inhumane vermin extermination project was carried out under the state law uh, <coughs> during the period of Japanese occupation, which declared, quote, all animals harmful to human beings will be hunted, end quote. The project, which was executed under the Governor General of Korea, classified many of the native species of superior predators in Korean ecosystem, such as tigers, leopards, bears, and wolves as vermin. The classification meant that these species could be hunted year-round without a permit or any limit of on the number killed. Meanwhile, the Korean landscape under the Japanese rule transformed dramatically from an agrarian one into the vibrant modern topos of commoner's life. All animals, including colonial Koreans, have been deeply conditioned by the radical transformation of their territories and modes of existence. Within this complex transitional time of modern Korean history, what do the Joseon Tigers that ended up displayed under the dim lights of the American Museum of Natural History indicate to us? They can represent the dialogue between the human and non-human concerning not only the displacement of the tiger's diasporic afterlife, but also the range of generic and thematic convergences beyond the anthropomorphic and projective perspectives of these uncanny stuffed creatures as allegories of national, historical, and colonial, <coughs> which germinate within the concealed structure of disjointed modernity of Korea. This non-decaying metaphor of tigers as continual coloniality that lingers on in my own experience as a subjective marginal historiographer in my writing, an extremely heterogeneous position compared to that of the objective historian, has given me an ambivalent empathy with which to think the intermingled past and present. This diplopic time of the animal and colonial life as non-human entangles with the memory of my once colonized homeland living with me in while simultaneously stimulating the unutterable discourse of the void of history and the loss of sovereignty among the colonized. Recollecting Gramscian's um, um, notions of interregnum, the disjointed time and space as a symptomatic contemporaneity, the ghostly return of this taxidermy during the colonial era permeated daily life as an uncanny genealogy of this jointed modernity of Korea. If we can posit the taxidermy of these Joseon tigers with Walter Benjamin's philosophy on the repetition of cultural history, then how do the stuffed animals manage to contain the possibility of the reproduction of the time in the sense of the afterlife of colonial modernity in Korea? Susan Buckmore's elaborate on this when she illustrates Benjamin's, Benjamin's fascination with a female wax figure, quoting him as saying, quote, her ephemeral act is frozen in time, end quote. Taxidermitted tigers are unchanging, defying organic decay, and constantly quarrying acts of crep crep crepuscular remembrance. The chosen tigers as taxidermy of non human diaspora are now the cultural embodiment of a particular historical moment. In this talk, I wish to examine two or three tigers in cartographic images, photography, and literature as a chronotope of the continual coloniality of Korea. As the tigers now roar silently in museums or exist in modes of animistic traditional fables appear in moralistic short stories as personified figures. Their scaffold, nonetheless, is their primordiality of the modern 
against the compressed modernizations of Korean society. Tigers preserved as a taxidermy time, that is, a spatial temporality intentionally excluded, sanitized, and colonized from the anthropoceptic concept of modern in the deja vu future yet to arrive. Starting from this most peculiar, melancholic, and mutually contradictory premise, I wish to make a historical conjecture as to the tropes of the tiger's inextricable binds to the trajectory of the knowledge structure in the realm of the present past, which I would like to focus on the continual coloniality. So I'm going to talk about the colonial man and animal from the past <coughs> or the modern. The French philosopher Gilles Deleuze explains the paradox of contemporaneity by pointing out that the past is the a priori precondition on which the present is founded. In other words, it is only when the present and the past exist in the singular and in the same time frame that time can flow wholly for the present. However, not all pasts are latent in the present since there is a past, the animal past, that has never been part of the present as a form of a pure past. Following Deleuzean's arguments, my question is, to what category of past does the era of the pre-modern of and primitiveness, as in the time of Tiger, belong, which we all believed die within us in the era of modernity? To what category does primordiality as a pure past belong to the sphere of post-modernity, if that's indeed what we should call the present? In the Joseon dynasty, tigers are portrayed ambiguously as both benevolent and malicious in early cultural texts of Korean pre-modern period. The tiger was worshipped as a shamanistic envoy of the mountain spirits called Sanshin, the most revered deity of Korean animism as a nemesis of evil and protector of the virtuous. For example, um, talismans and protective um, paintings against the evil on residential gates prominently featured depicting of tigers. <clears throat> At the same time, there are various Korean folk idioms such as a day old dog does not even know the fear of a tiger, expressing the uh, horror the ferocious tiger engendered. During the Joseon dynasty, numerous systematic tiger extermination projects were um, implemented as tigers are uh, designated as a hohan, the tiger disaster, and a bounty system and special battalions of chakogamsa, uh, which means the tiger hunting soldiers, was established. Due to the systematic campaign of tiger hunting, the tiger population, along with tiger attacks, seem to have decreased enough to preserve the species from the normal rating of hunting. If we could postulate the resurrection of tiger as an ontological issue preceding the topos of translating the pre-modern to colonial Korea, how might we utilize the academic disciplines of the humanities to decipher the links between such symptoms and effects from the pre-modern past that has never been part of the present? Georgia Agamben argues in his book, The Opera, The Man and Animal, published in 2004, that humans have always contemplated the incomprehensible zygote of the supernatural, social, and sacred elements through natural organisms, and for that reason have learned to contemplate human essence in accordance with the difference between humanity and animality. In other words, Agamben argues that the various deprived epistemological differences designed to separate humans from animals and nature were possible ultimately only because the strategically molded anthropological machine of the moderns that otherized animals. <clears throat> Humanity, as we know it today, has been built up from such invention of anthroposeptic differences, which is the state of the descendant 
cadre that tries to place humans above animals and nature in the hierarchical order and articulation. This human-animal hierarchy was already structured, looking at the tigers ambivalently as both shamanistic spiritual guardian symbolically and the menace of agrarian economy of physically during the Joseon dynasty. For example, in the Animism Exhibition project, Anselm Franke embraced the Derridian ontology of modern visual and intellectual history as the curatorial methodology, which could not but be placed in the state of a vacuum in the narrative of his history. Franke embraces the spectral history of the modern knowledge system of the other as part of an animal animistic discourse and actively re-invoke the names that fall under animism. By doing this, he raises a flag of objection against the basic human-centric discursive frameworks supporting the system of modern museums and schools and immigration and mental health policies as well as a scientific epistemology based on animal experimentation. All these were systems established under the aegis of modern social cultural anthropology, which itself was greatly influenced by the work of Franz Boa, who believed in the process of language, technology, and evolution of social forms. Potentially, as an a priori condition and animism as a pure memory are strange bad fellows in modernity. In this sense, Franke suggested that a symbiosis of this mutually alien state is possible through their cohabitation and contact with one another. In making such a suggestion, Franke indirectly delivers a meta-narrative and a genealogy of the symbolic system of the Western modern knowledge system through reenactment of animism. It is hoped that the discourses on animals, non-human, hyphenated subjectivities, which have always existed, but which have been suppressed and hidden, will not gradually bring about a rupture in the dominant political topography of hierarchy, restore the warm and smooth texture of its original organic state, and freely cross the boundaries of various spheres. The question now is, who warrants the subjectivity of the non-human that Franke wishes to reinstate? Are the emotions, languages, and knowledge system of the non-human always binomially opposed to those of the humans? What if the history of modernity is a narrative built upon a joint silence about the age-old discourse called animism or the tropes of animality? And what if the current state of the narrative imaginative vacuum is direct result of such collective silence among us? Franke answers to these questions as it follows. This silence tells us that it is actually not animism, but modernity that is the ghost halfway between presence and absence, life and death, and the future grand narratives of modernity may well speak of this ghost from the perspective of its others, from its animist side. If the metonymy of interregnum, which Grams Gramsci describes as an um, intermediate state between life and death, could be exchanged with Frank's notions of animism as equivalents, we can find a series of, of visual representation from the art world as well as from the sphere of mass media and pop culture. The problem lies in the philosophical conundrum that animism has created in the sphere of epistemology and ontology outside of the pr um, permissible visual representational systems. In this context of Korean modernity, the crucial aspects of this interstitial return of the primitive tropes or the tigers as a chronotope of continual coloniality is pre precisely that is a reification of multi-layered modernities that makes fissures in such a cognitive topography of the modern. Animism or a return of the primordial is a sign of revolt against falling into embodied habitual thinkings, a defense of anti-rationalisms, a fundamental questioning of the demarcation of normalcy and abnormalcy. As such, 
it tacitly recognizes at the discursive level non-human subjects as subjective individuals. Accordingly, the premise of exploring animism um, symbolizes inevitably the possibility of losing our comfortable sense of contemporaneity and the implosion of modern humanist thought that had endlessly otherized and hyphenated the non-human and non-living. The new order of bodilies and the foundation for logic decontextualize the non-spontaneous cultural borders that exist between individuals and the world, world and become the subversive um, substructure for overcoming the false monopoly of human-centered notions of such subjective recognition. So in this relationship, I will specifically going to focus on the tigers in uh, several images. The modern concept of the tiger as a crowned top started from the reimagining of the Korean peninsula in the shape of a tiger. The modern Korean intellectual, Chen nam initiated a geographical project whereby Korean territory was zoomorphically mapped out in the archetypal image of the tiger as a way of symbolizing independent Joseon. And this first appeared in the magazine Youth in um, 1910, and he added further description about the cover painting where he explained that by drawing Korea as tiger, he wished to express the country's infinite development and unfathomable nature of the Korean progressive spirit. The main trope of Chen nam geographic reinterpretations of the Korean peninsula through zoomorphic mapping was the juxtaposition of the shamanistic recuperation of traditional Korean spirits and identification with the country's most familiar yet territorial apex predator, the tiger, as a national allegory as he proclaimed the Korean peninsula, quote, the brave roaring tiger clawing against the Asian continents, end quote. Chen nam tiger map was deeply embroidered on the heart of Koreans under the Japanese occupation period. However, in the midst of the cultural formation of the modern nation state of colonial Korea under the Japanese rule, geographical imagination and the modern concept of self and other gave way to a new sense of a modern order and transformative self-invention among Koreans. During the period of Japanese occupation, anthropology as an imperial discipline and popular tropes began unconsciously internalizing the contradiction inherent in the discourse of self and other among Koreans. And furthermore, it propagated various models of Asian other, playing them against each other and encouraging competition between the colonies. At the same time, anthropologists such as Tori Ryujo of Japan secured the self-identity as a superior Asian who was almost white but not quite, while internalizing the Orientalist gaze overlaid on top of the colonized other. Through various discourses on race, gender, and pseudoscientific anthropological discourses, Imperial Japan maintained its self-identity and reorganized Asian's epistemological topography with the logics of inclusions and exclusions, interior, inferiority and ex, um, superiority, and naichi and gaichi, inner and outer. The superiority of the Japanese self was thus secured by emphasizing the non-humanity subject that does, that like close to the animal status and the logic of exclusions and inferiority against the Korean other. Therefore, the academic disciplines of ethnologies and anthropologies lay the ideological foundation of the empire and its biopolitics. They inculcated in the colonized um, Korean a sense of self as a secondary citizen of the Japanese empire. They were the ambivalent mechanism through which the body and mind of the Asian race were mobilized. In the midst of this discursive formation, Chen Amsan tried to represent homogeneous and territorial sovereignty by reimagining the Korean peninsula under the Japanese occupation as a tiger through the medium of zoomorphic tiger geography 
and by serial publication of printed media. Tongsai uh, Winchakul's concept of the geobody focuses on the role of modern maps, the visual and epistemological demarcation of people and generation of a national consciousness concerning not only the territoriality of the nation, but also the geographic image of the nation itself as a source of pride, loyalty, love, passion, bias, hatred, reason, and unreason. However, the relationship between the nationalistic geomorphic imagery of the tiger and its allegorical narrative of Japanese anthropological perception to Koreans and the urban reformation of the Korean Peninsula that followed as well as the mass extermination of the tiger as a national symbol through trophy hunting created a contradictory circumstances for the Korean people. As a consequence of Japanese urban reformation of the colonial metropolis in the name of modernization, the colonial metropolis, Gyeongseong, began to lose its natural landscape through urban transformation. The result of this shift was that the dazzling transformation of the city's downtown districts stimulated ordinary Koreans' desire for modernization. The tiger, as powerful, independent, primitive, feared as a vicious killer, used as a primitive and nationalistic trope of both benevolence and patriotism, pulls in Korean collective consciousness as a double suture, both of symbolic terminations of sovereignty and national pride, and revealing the real rupture from tradition. Various Western colonial trophy hunters and Japanese imperialists sought to um, elevate their status above the colonies through the hunting and display of countless slaughtered Korean tigers during the early 20th century in Korea. Then, there was a sudden shift in the tiger's traditions and amiable and valiant disposition in various fables, proverbs, novelas. These turned the creature into the maligned predator or harmful man-killing vermin, which threatened the progress of modernity and must be massacred in order to accomplish the process of colonial modernization. During the Japanese colonial period, tiger hunting, tiger meat eating tasting, and tiger cubs kept in the houses of high ranking Japanese officials became popular pastimes. And for example, there was a sizable 150 people tiger hunting party organized by the wealthy businessman named Yamamoto Tadasaburo. The party managed to slaughter three tigers. The physical and metaphorical killings of Korean tigers by Japanese had strong imperialistic connotations. This is because the fierce, um, ferocious tiger had been adopted as a symbol of Korea and Korean nationalism under the Japanese rule. The independent nation and Korean ethnic identity were both symbolized by the tiger. The tiger was the fiercest and strongest of all creatures and would nurture young Korean into strong jiggy, the determined and um, spirited, was the hope expressed in an editorial article in Hwang Song Shinbun, the Capital Gazette. The tiger became the embodiment of pride of um, Korea and the loss of the sovereignty at the same time. These chronotopic transformations of the allegorical tiger as a spiritual animal symbolizing nationalism into a malign predator threatening modernity was vividly portrayed in the Japanese intellectuals and novelist Nakajima Atsushi's poetic novella called Torakari, Tiger Hunting, which was published in 1934. His unique observation of colonial life in Korea was markedly unlike that of other Japanese writers who supported the indoctrinations of the colonial cultural assimilation, so-called Naisen Itai, uh, the ideology of Japan and Korea as a singular body. His primary motivation was to show how Korea had gradually become saturated and assimilated into the surveillance system of the Japanese imperialists, but his focus was on the self-deception of the colonized and the logical contradiction of this Naisen Itai and Japanese occupation of the colony 
which he expressed through sharp criticism and detached sensibility. The Tiger Hunting is a story told in the first person narratives by a young Japanese man who has unusual friendship with a colonial Korean classmate, Jo De Hwan, a bourgeois Korean student who attends a Japanese school in Gyeongsang. In the midst of the nihilistic saturation of sentiment in colonial Korea during the mid 1920s, I reflects the problematic Jo Senjin, Jo's cynicism toward the Japanese classmates. He says, who do, um, Japanese don't know anything about delicate modern aestheticism. And his unrealistic self-pride and condescending nihilisms as one of the colonized toward the colonizers, and I, as a Japanese, also criticize a contradictory Japanese assimilation policy in Korea. Joe's apathetic nihilism forces the reader to appreciate the hopeless, emasculated, dissatisfaction of colonized man, which many anecdotes of Atsushi's um, school years express, especially when Joe's severely beaten up by his Japanese classmates for his arrogant attitude, even as one of the colonized. And I empathetically recollected the narrator's sympathy for Joe's, who crying confess that he could not resist them for undescribable fear. He says, the Japanese, um, you know, Atsushi says, I was happy to know that Cho, who had been so sarcastic and proud of himself, showed himself true self, a naked coward, colonized, realizing the fact that he is Naichijin, which is, uh, he's not Naichijin, it's Japanese. That difference between us gave me a satisfaction. While colonial masculinity in crisis is revealed in Cho's scopophilic confession, I, as a colonizer, recuperated the narrator's own superior position as a colonizer by observing the despair of the pompous colonized subjects. Atsushi's literary text depict, depicted the colonial reality of his own connection with the ideology of um, assimilation, and this, express, this is expressed both in the contradictory reaction to the narrator's fathers because of um, his fathers never liked me getting into the close relationship with Cho while he was always preaching to me about how Korea and Japan should be unified under the same citizenship. And there is also the revere, uh, reverse um, colonialism within the colonized um, community. And they decide to go to the tiger hunting. The narrator recalls um, um, the Cho's secret proposed going on tiger huntings um, near Gyeongsang. And after a long wait of ambush, they see a tiger which attempts to play with Jo Senjin, one of the Korean servants in the morning dust. But follow three gunshots, the tiger falls to the ground and I and Cho get to look closely at a real tiger for the first time. It is then that I is confronted with the bare life of the Korean. What surprised me was Cho's attitude that time, and as you may read, he didn't even hurt at all, like the servant. And then he actually kicked the servant, and then there was no victims of the tragedies, and Cho had been expecting to see a spectacle that um, one of the Korean servants were actually killed by the tigers. And he said, the Japanese um, protagonist says, suddenly I felt like I saw the blood of a powerful colonial family by watching Cho's cruel and indifferent eyes. Cho's primal fear as a colonized male is not related to fear for the tiger itself, but his damaged masculinity as an allegory of the dead tiger as Korea's lost sovereignty invigorated the embedded colonialism of his colonized mind. So Cho's ambivalence as both a cruel bourgeois master to his servant and the inferior colonized as Cho Senjin gave him a scopophobic anxiety since um, it, at the end of the novel, Cho is eventually disappear after the tiger hunting trips and, relate, and it, that is a closer related to the mobilizations of the voyeuristic modes of spectacle of colonial modernity during the time. In this sense, I, I will uh, move on to the post-liberation periods. Um, 
so since the liberation of Korea, such differentiations amounts to no more than the narrative of the ethnic abjections in which the West or the formal empires internalizes the meaning through the relation, relational um, networks of others. The differentiation is no more than the molding flasks of cultural capital which shape desires devoid of any historical context. The question then here is, in East Asian context or in Korean context, after the Japanese defeat and Korean liberation, how do the discourses of colonialism and pseudo-scientific anthropology remain as a historical trauma among Koreans who remember the colonialisms? Post-colonial Koreans have witnessed the internal, internalized rhetoric of colonialisms and self-consciously uttered the return of the narrative of this purported um, purity of Korean monoethnicity and imitations of the colonizers. How have these symptoms become embedded as scars, traumas, and loss of memory among Koreans? And what do the signs of the return of the primordial say about Korean post-colonial modernity after all? The tendency of the post-war period of South Korean society was for its, represent uh, its representatives to take a diverse cultural approach that obsessively repeated the old narrative of retrieving the Japanese colonial era by passing through manic depressive narratives of the joy of liberation and the anxiety of the divided countries. The agenda for casting Japanese colonial history into oblivion from numerous Korean media culture was subsequently replaced quite smoothly with the nationalistic campaign of anti-communism and the heyday of new, liber new liberation by Sung Malari's government. The undisguised grudges continued at the very interior of Korean national self-refashioning during the Jeju every third massacres, for example, and the Korean War, along with the anti-communist ideologies born through experience in the division of a nation. The Japanese as a monstrous remnants that need to be subjugated and removed from the official collective memories of the Koreans by the Sung Man government and US military um, occupation control, which attempted to utilize the suppressing apparatus became a narrative of a media culture and formed its propaganda after the liberation period. Post-colonialism and the West, Western modernization process in um, South Korea, like a game of cross and pile, have been structured on the basis of this contradictory modernism. The society, built on this unstable base, destabilized by the international laws, uh, intentional laws of much of the colon um, colonial past, while searching for a pre-colonial past trooped as traditional, while um, distancing itself from the bitter memories that came from um, um, Japanese occupation period. Um, in December 1942, during the Asia Pacific War, the Japanese Empire ordered the decree of elementary schools through indoctrinations of nice and itais. And under the decree, the existing Korean primary schools, so called Sohakyo, were changed into Japanese style elementary school, where Joseon children were raised as potential fascist soldiers and were forced to worship the Yasukuni Shirin and swear the oath of imperial Japanese citizenship. And reading the Japanese youth magazines such as uh, Shonen Gurakbu or manga called Adventure of Tangichi or some of the, the anim uh, animated um, um, the cartoonic images of the private second class, the Norakuro, in Japanese wartime animations and Japan, um, Japan's enemy um, and colonized people frequently appeared in an animal form. Um, reading these Japanese youth magazines and um, cultures. After the liberation, the Joseon children suddenly all turned into the Isungbo after the liberation. Isungbo was a nine-year-old South Korean boy brutally murdered by the North Korean commanders in December 1968. And the case of his mother was widely publicized throughout the South Korea the Park uh, during the Park Chang-hee dictatorships. In the early 1990s, and many of the historians actually claimed that his death was a creation of anti-communist propaganda. 
since uh, Istanbul had never existed. So these anti-communist boys, you know, hated communists, and then after liberation were raised as a fathers who featured in the conquering the monsters of the North popular media stories, such as the propaganda animations uh, General Dorin. The majority of South Korean did not get a chance to mourn their loss of sovereignty, their own absence of historical consciousness, or to forgive the others. After the liberation, basically, they settled for becoming a victims of the discursive frameworks generated through the tropes of the comfort women's Korean War and the division of the nations. And in addition, their children who recognize the North Koreans as a horned devils and animals participated in anti-communist oratorical speechy or propaganda poster contests, proliferating their own individual fascism among themselves. Most South Korean children commenced the school day by repeating the charter of national education with the phrase in front of proudly hosted Korean national flag and watching American animations by Disney's and seminal Japanese anime. And we have to think that in fact, there have, they have grown up in strikingly similar environments to colonizers in their hybrid realities. The two biggest wars to broke out following the rearrangement of um, the po post-colonial Asia into nation state were the Korean War and the Vietnam War. And through participation in Vietnam War was a masses of uh, empires of the US and Japanese empire, um, the South Korean sending their healthy sons and husband to the take part in the Asia Pacific War to support the Japanese empire. And similar to necropolitical logics of Japanese intellectual discourses and inventions of the Park Chang-hee military government persuaded South Koreans to dispatch their husbands and sons as a volunteer soldiers to the Vietnam jungle to fight, the, to, uh, to fight to revive South Korea's capitalist existence. And Park Chang-hee government rearranged uh, to dispatch troops to Vietnam through Vietnam, uh, through re um, ratifications of a treaty called the Brown Memorandum for the sake of the economic um, aid from the US from 1965 to 1973. And over 320,000 South Korean military soldiers were sent to Vietnam under the banner of nation's modernization. Indeed, resulting in a major turning point for South Korea in terms of economic growth, majorly focused on the Jebel, the Korean conglomerates, such as during the time Hyundai, um, Daewoo, and um, uh, Hanjin, uh, which were given construction contracts in uh, Vietnam. And this enabled Korean workers to find jobs in the abounding um, Vietnamese economy after the war. Um, in the wake of this, locating these traumas of the Korean wars and the proletarizations of the um, Koreans from the rural areas during the Vietnam War, the collective desire of Koreans towards compressed modernization found itself paralyzed by the enchantment with the phantasmagorical majority. The materiality was the imperial consequence of liberation and eloquently conveyed a collective conjuration cut by a simulacrum of admiration for modernization process during the times. And during the fast infiltrations of this introduc um, introduction of modernization movement in South Korea during the mid-1960s, Park Chang-hee provided an interesting compilation of forms, propaganda pr um, paralleled with images and use of the Vietnam War. And by disseminating the spectacles of visual propaganda in the forms of sanitized form of violence and discourses of national solidarity, Park Chang-hee interpolated the nations into being by using the pronoun constantly, us, we, for the sake of um, um, building the imagined communities. In the midst of the jungle in Vietnam, where Korean soldiers disguised the massacre of numerous Vietnamese civilians as a humanitarian aid, numerous photographs of tigers, corpses, killed by Korean soldiers were taken. Tigers once symbolizing the national sovereignty of colonial Korea, were exhibited with their guts cut, slaughtered by war veterans of the Tiger Divisions. Metaphorically, these expose 
the imagery topography on which South Korea, with its internalizations of colonial logics and experience that mirrored the other Asian countries like North Korea or Vietnam, consolidated its position as a sub-imperialist nation by dispatching soldiers to the Vietnam War through an act of post-colonial mimicry. In this light, post-South Korean society suppressed the individual desires we enforce sacrifices and mimic the colonizers with the phallic capitalist victimizers mask through their voluntary alliance and participation in the war alongside the US. And in doing so, during the process of const um, constructing the modern nation state, the state controlled capitalism has unavoidably borne irrationality and madness. The irrational compressed modernization of Park jang reconstructed South Korea's paradoxical identity as both colonizer and colonized by making others, such as Korean working class soldiers dispatched to Vietnam, nurses sent to work in Germany during the time, the Yang Gongju, the sex workers, enslaved for the pleasure of American soldiers in the American military camp town female factory workers during the 1960s and 70s, communists, and the whole Jalado provinces as a scapegoats. So we still silently turn this switch of the trauma and fascism on and off within the other's conscious unconsciousness, floating as a specters in Lee Seung Bok's anti-communist education agenda and Park jung mo modernization process. And this post-colonial prosthetic mo modernity embedded within the colonial memory from two empires between Japan and the US caused a post-colonial pathology in which the South Koreans incessantly imitate the empires while underestimating themselves and thereby limiting their own possibilities. <laughs>